Well, the word Bible actually comes from the Greek word biblia, which means books. It's a little bit like the word bibliotech if you ever studied French. Bibliotech means library. And so in many ways, this is like an amazing library, all found within one cover. There is actually 66 different books contained within the Bible, and it's split into two main parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you wanted to remember how many books were in the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you're interested in this, then uh, take the, the number of letters in the word old, so that's one, two, three, and take the uh, number of letters in the word testament, and you've got nine. And if you put them together, three and nine, you've got 39. Okay, so there's 39 books in the Old Testament. It, the same can be true for the New Testament. So if you take the number of letters in the word new, that's three, and the number of letters in the word testament, you've got nine. Now you can't have 39 because 39 of 39 isn't 66. So what you need to do here is you need to times the three by the nine, multiply them together, and you come up with the answer 27. So there's 39 books in the Old Testament and there's 27 books in the New Testament. Well, the way that the Bible has been put together is absolutely fascinating. It took more than 40 authors over more than 1,500 years across three different continents to write the whole contents of our Bible. The three continents are Europe, Asia, and Africa, if you're interested. Like I say, it, it was written by many different authors, some of them very famous, such as Moses. He wrote the first five books, all the way, otherwise known as the Pentateuch. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're also known as the law as well. So you might see that in scripture when it talks about the law of Moses. It's talking about the Pentateuch. You've got other authors as well, such as David, who might not have written a whole book, but definitely wrote chapters. So things like the Psalms, he wrote many of them. And then you've also got authors that we don't know of. For example, the Hebrew author is somewhat of a mystery, although many people like to speculate who it is. The Bible was written in three original languages. In the Old Testament, it was written predominantly in ancient Hebrew, the language of the Israelite people as well as Aramaic, which is a local language that Jesus spoke when he was on the earth. The New Testament, again, parts of that are written in Aramaic. So when Jesus speaks, he speaks in Aramaic, but it is also written predominantly in Greek. And so as the writers write to each other, they'll be writing as they, so for example, Paul writing to Timothy, he's actually writing in Greek. There is lots of different types of literature within the Bible as well. And so it's good to know what type of literature that you're reading at the time so that you can understand it a little bit better. Many of the books are history books. So things like Genesis, uh, the Gospels, Acts, um, Joshua, um, Ruth, all these kind of books here are history books. So it's facts, it's times and places of people that actually existed. We've got other books such as poetry, so we've got the likes of the Psalms, and we've got wisdom literature such as Proverbs. We've got lots of different writings like that. We've also got many letters, predominantly in the New Testament, letters to churches as they establish and to correct their teaching, and letters to individuals as well, such as Philemon is a fascinating read. It's written to a slave master after his slave became a Christian when he was on the run really interesting letters to read. And of course, we've also got prophecy books as well. And that's quite interesting really, isn't it, to think about prophecy. But we've got um, things like the Old Testament prophets along with Daniel. And we've of course got Revelation as well, which is God's word spoken through people to us or God revealing something through somebody so that they can speak into the situation or indeed into our future. So is the Bible still influential today? The answer is yes. And quite often people are using parts of the Bible without realizing that they're actually taken from the Bible. For example, some of the quotes that we use, such as getting away with it by the skin of our teeth, 
the writings on the wall, Job's comforter. All of these phrases have been taken from biblical stories and recounts. We've also got lots of films that have used parts of scripture or indeed taken a whole storyline and put it into their blockbuster movie. For example, The Miracle Maker, The Passion of the Christ, The Prince of Egypt, Noah, Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty, even Pulp Fiction. Samuel L. Jackson quotes parts of scripture in his, in his character. And then we've got musicals such as um, Joseph and the Technical Dreamcoat and novels, The Chronicles of Narnia. We've even got um, references to the Bible within our pop music as well. So things like um, Mumford and Sons, uh, Katy Perry, Stevie Wonder, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, all these kind of people have used parts of the Bible, maybe a quote or a phrase or a line or a Bible story or recount, and they've put it into their work. And we also see um, the Bible being used to bring about great social change as well. For example, Martin Luther King, he quotes from the Bible in his famous I Have a Dream speech. Or Florence Nightingale and Mother Teresa, William Wilberforce bringing the abolition of slavery forwards in the government. Uh, these guys have been influenced by what they've read within the Bible and it's brought great change and is still bringing change in our lives today. And what about the power of the Bible? There are people dedicated to getting Bibles into people's hands. That's their full-time job. Uh, people like the Gideons who seek to give out copies of the Psalms and the New Testament. Uh, others who seek to translate it into many different languages. I was looking at the Wycliffe Bible Translators website today and I found out that the Bible so far in its entirety has been translated into 698 different languages. That's from cover to cover. We know personally in our family, family friends, whose job it is to check Bible translations to make sure that the meaning is accurate. We've also got the New Testament in a further 1,548 different languages. And then just portions of the Bible, it might be a parable or some Psalms or a piece of scripture, it's been translated into a further 1,138 different languages. So as I read those statistics, I thought, Surely the work's almost done. Surely nearly everybody has the Bible in their language. And yet what I found out was that one in five people um, have no access to the Bible at all. And so there are people committed to getting the Bible right across the world. Why is that? And I've got two other examples, in fact, three other examples of people who've risked it all. For example, Corrie Ten Boom. Here's one of her stories in my father's house, but she had, she, her famous book is called The Hiding Place. She was willing to go to a concentration camp through the Nazi invasion because of her love of the Bible and the call that it put on her life. Or well, how about uh, William Tyndale, who paid the ultimate price because he wanted the Bible in English so that people could read it. We're talking like hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But he was willing to risk it all and in fact paid with his life to have the Bible translated into English. And how about this example? This book is brilliant. It's called The God Smuggler. And it's a personal testimony of a man called Brother Andrew who's devoted his life to smuggling Bibles into communist countries and now works, or at least his organisation does, with the persecuted church. There is something within these pages that is calling people to, uh, to, to make a change and in fact is transforming their lives. So let's have a look at what it says about itself. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 verse 16 it says this, all scripture, that's the Bible, is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Can you see that? Christians believe that this Bible here is not just words on a page. It's not just 40 different authors from 1,500 years writing their own thing. It actually tells one big story. 
And the reason that it's so coherent and fits so well together is because it's God breathed. That means that God has inspired the words. And so Christians believe as they open this book and read it, they are actually hearing God's own words to them in their life. And that's why it's transformed many people's lives. Well, this is the end of our session, but it's just to set you up with two main ideas now. Like we said, there is like a golden thread that weaves right through scripture and it all tells one big story. It's otherwise known as the gospel, okay? Gospel is a a combination of two words, God meaning good and spell meaning word. So it's the good word or the good news, okay? And as we go through our journey over the next few videos, we're going to find out exactly what that good news is. So we have in the Bible two versions of the good news. It's the same message, it's just in two different forms. It might be the gospel in a nutshell, okay? It might be just a couple of verses or a sentence or uh, maybe even a paragraph where the writer has tried to sum up this good news of the Bible in a very short statement. But we also have something called the whole counsel of God. And that's as we read right the way through scripture, as we read right the way through the Bible, we build a big picture that points towards this good news again. And so we're going to go on the journey. I don't want to spoil anything, but we're going to go on the journey. And each session, we're going to look at what the gospel is within that recount found within the Bible.